Thanks for downloading this episode of the BIMTube podcast. Just a reminder that you can access all the podcasts in video and audio if you visit bim.tube. So our website again is at bim.tube. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the BIM Tube podcast. My name is Stephen, and today I'm with James Kavanagh, who's from RICS. So, welcome, James. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, great to talk to you again. Great. Thank you. So, we're, as with all these podcasts, just to remind people that are seeing it for the first time, the, we, there are assumed audience of people that are not specialists in data digital or, or even geospatial today, but nevertheless, we will talk about these topics. So, so again, thank you for joining me. Thank you for your time. I'll what I'll do is as I start with most people, is ask if you would kindly introduce yourself. And then crucially for people watching or listening, also if you could just give a, an introduction to your background and how did you get into the role that you have now? So take as long as you want on that because that's really important for people that are just starting out in their career, perhaps. So over to you, James. Yeah, uh, my name is James, James Kavanagh. I'm uh, I'm a native of Dublin, which you can probably tell from my accent already. And uh, and I, I suppose I took a, a reasonably long route into what we would call geospatial surveying these days. So I, I trained as an old style general practice land surveyor in HND, uh, our national degree diploma, uh, sponsored by the European Social Fund in uh, uh, Dublin Institute of Technology in the late 1980s. So a very traditional land survey course. You know, these were in the very very early days of people just starting to understand what GIS meant and, and also uh, how GNSS, GPS positioning would, would start to revolutionize the world. I actually remember during my course when we were dealing with photogrammetry, so, you know, imagery, that we just started to get 386 machines so we could start to do uh, uh, appropriate levels of processing. But there was still a lot of stuff done but in an analog sense. I suppose the great thing about that was that, you know, it gives you a deep kind of understanding of what's going on inside that black box. And that was something that our, our lecturers were always very uh, keen on in Dublin. So after finishing there in 1988, like most Irish people of that generation, we either got on a plane to America or a boat to England. I came over to the UK, started to work on all these very large infrastructure projects down in Canary Wharf, Channel Tunnel, King's Cross, Liverpool Street uh, development, and, and got more into the engineering side of, of land survey, so more into the engineering side of it, so all that dimensional control, site work, construction work, kind of understanding construction methodologies, etc. And still again, quite analog, but you know, this was in the, very much on the cusp of, of, a, of an age of using CAD for the first time. You know, so moving from site plants and the, the nightmares of trying to keep those things up to date on a massive job like Canary Wharf, uh, right the way through into in, into starting to use kind of digital electronic distance measurement equipment on site. So the, the main control network, you know, uh, uh, work more ordnance survey on that, bringing it onto site, steel work, marine piling. It was multifaceted. And of course, I was in my early 20s. So, uh, you know, with the energy that that kind of uh, age brings. So uh, it was all great. And I really cut my teeth in engineering surveying, which is why I've always had a great deal of respect for people who work in heavy civil engineering, you know, particularly uh, on large, difficult jobs like that. Uh, my, 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 my career kind of uh, took a bit of a different, uh, I, I suppose, move when I, when I, uh, I got a job at the United Nations in, in the Middle East uh, and started mapping properly beforehand I was really doing you know control network coordinate control dimensional control on site and uh, but started to then kind of intersect with mapping and into land registration and land administration tenure security ownership etc it was in uh, uh, we were in the refugee camps of Gaza the West Bank Palestinian occupied territories it was all quite uh, edgy in many ways you know I had a team of six Palestinian land surveyors who uh, who were very well trained and uh, but couldn't quite get their hands on the on the latest te uh, technology equipment. So we, with the UN, were able to bring that in and train people up. But this is when I started to understand how geospatial information, although we didn't call it then, how mapping information and geography really started to affect people's lives. And, uh, you know, a map is something that's seen as being permanent. So being able to explain yourself and what you're doing when, you, when you're in some of these uh, uh, 
some of these areas, particularly camp areas, is extremely important. People see uh, mapping or, or geospatial data as given something a, a certain permanency, which of course, if you're in a refugee situation, you don't particularly want to be seen as a being a permanent situation. Uh, then they, I started to get dragged into cadastral work, into neighbor disputes, into people encroaching on, on UN property. Uh, uh, all that kind of work, and actually did a did, did a nice output from all of that, which is available online as well, which is uh, uh, by me, uh, so mapping in in a political context in in Gaza and the West Bank, which is available online, which seems to be downloaded hundreds of times uh, over the last while, particularly as things hot up in that part of the world and people are looking for an insight into that, and then. Uh, uh, I returned to the UK, went back to university uh, in University of East London. So then really started to kind of understand the, uh, the deeper kind of beyond data capture use of data management issues, geodetic issues, of course, which, which is one of my favorite, but also that combination of mathematics and geography and, and that, uh, that, that strong kind of tradition of, of land administration, land registration, that, uh, that UEL or NELP as it was known before that in the early 90s, uh, uh, it really has. And uh, I've been working with the or with uh, uh, the Royal Institution of Charters of Earth uh, for the last 20 years, nearly. And uh, uh, the usual thing, you know, you uh, you get charter status, you start to have a young family and you need that kind of permanency behind you. So an, an office job in central London started. And also I could really see that a, a job in the RICS would give me access the things that you don't particularly access as a, as a working, as a working surveyor, you know, uh, uh, being on the tools is not always easy, uh, uh, physically certainly uh, exciting as it is, and uh, and also I, I I really wanted to become more involved in the in the political drivers behind it. Things were changing in, in the late nineties, the early noughties within geospatial, very quickly actually. The the arguments over the names around geomatics, for instance, that usage. Also, the uh, the turning off of selective availability by uh, by Bill Clinton. So G GPS suddenly became part of our kit bag, uh, and more than anything. The, uh, the greater availability of GIS software and data, more importantly. So, you know, we really felt that we were on the, uh, on, on the cusp of a bit of a new age there. And I think that, you know, trying to drive the profession forward on a you know, better understanding of standards and ethics and just professionalism in general you know it's time to grow up really as a profession and uh, and of course make sure that our uh, uh, that our fellow land and geospatial surveyors were paid better and better respected within the professional society and and here i am 20 years later steve head of uh, of land and resources now i i also deal with rural practice and planning and development and minerals and waste management environment for instance telecommunications but i can really see but but geospatial has always been my first love you know i'll always bring it along with me and i can really see it's in, it's interactivity uh, uh and how it intersects with, with other very very important uh, uh particularly policy issues at the moment the there's been a big report just released by the house of lords just last week on land use in the UK, you know that's 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 a, an initiative been driven forward by the Geospatial Commission within within the Cabinet Office, which is a huge step forward in in the UK context of understanding our profession. So we, uh, and there's a lot more to do, but I think we've achieved a lot over the last uh, uh, twenty years or so. And I know you, we, me, and you have been involved in this for a long time, all the way from the start of Geo Business. And yeah, a few issues. years. When was that? 2014, I think. That <laughs> yes. geo business. I think we were doing BIM and stuff before that, but and and GIS. But th thank you, James. Th thank you for for that overview and and the, the the journey that you've taken. I, I mean, I, again, obviously we have a geospatial background. <clears throat> There'll be people listening to this that don't because they're only focused on generic data and information. But um, to this might seem a ridiculous question to ask you, but can you explain what we mean by geospatial? <laughs> well, I, I, I or, or is that a trick question? What do you, what do you mean by it? So again, imagine someone that isn't from our sector. Maybe they're not even an IT professional. What what what, what is in that that bucket, and how you know what are the benefits of using it? But I, I think it, it's most simplest, and if you want to get philosophical about things, it's essentially a perfect mathematical representation of reality. And the, and this this is what we struggle with, you know, uh, is to, to make it as accurate as, as people would would want it to be, but also in, in dealing with that accuracy and that capturing of information to make sure that it's usable 
and interoperable with other types of information. So, you know, we, we, we look around and I know you probably do the same where you're looking around the room that you're in now and you're visualizing it almost in your head as what would that look like in a BIM or yeah. GIS yeah. format or, or in a point cloud format because we, you tend to start to see in those type of uh, yeah. modes, I think, after a few years being involved into it. But to me, it, it is that uh, mathematical representation of reality, yeah. you know, that each point is separate from the other, coordinated with depending on what, you know, the nuances of transformations, et cetera, and mapping projections. And at its, its kind of its, its highest level, it's essentially, you know, that, that, that process of mapping. So I, I trace our lineage. We may call ourselves geospatial now, you know, but I trace our lineage all the way back to the ancient Greeks and, you know, and those first maps mm -hmm. of the world, you know, Ptolemy and the, the Severus that, yeah. that went out with Alexander the Greats, you know, and, and those, the, those great mappers and, uh, and geographers and hydrographers, of course, like Captain Cook that circumnavigated the world and, and, and did that kind of bit, broad view and i think that's sometimes the difficulty we have with it is that we're dealing with very very accurate information right the way up to one is one million one is the five five million kind of scale yeah information and trying to explain that differentiation between uh how accuracy works is is, is one of those kind of constant kind of uh, uh gordian knots that we always have to deal with within the geospatial fraternity Com completely and and i know some people that would be very pleased that you've sort of traced it back to mapping that'd be very good so uh myself included <laughs> but uh, so yeah yeah um but but i mean i think there's so there's so many different um people that now use i guess either the maps or the information or the representation i think that's one of the challenges as well isn't it where it used to be rightly or wrongly there were specialist surveyors and there still are mm -hmm. but it used to be more of a specialist thing i know early in my career i was cartographer we well, i had my own room <laughs> people would ask can i have a map and we'd do magic stuff and a map would come out at the end so so i think that's completely changed but then i again i think it has the challenges like we're talking about how do we communicate i mean there were some themes that you've mentioned that maybe we talk about i mean again assuming that people with that are listening are not specialists in in these things one of the topics that you mentioned is data currency and data provenance now yeah. um I mean, what, what do you want to say about that, basically? I mean, there's so much we could talk about, but again, for someone who's not familiar with that, what, what do we mean and what are some of the top challenges around that them issue? So data currency provenance. Well, I, th I think they're, they're, they're two of the most difficult issues that I think we deal with as a profession and explaining that to clients and uh, 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 and related professions. You know, data currency is incredibly important, as you know. It's about the up-to-dateness of the data, out-of-date data, the, the geospatial information is is not so good you know uh, uh and provenance understanding where it's come from and i think when people are gathering different data sets together and mixing and matching you know you see people grabbing uh, satellite information uh national mapping background information uh, plans title plans from land registry you know uh, uh field surveys a kind of a, a, a survey that it got a hand of right the way to to one that's just done a couple of days ago and trying to bring all that together but understanding the provenance of that information and its inherent inaccuracy or accuracy and how these things work together is an incredibly important part of how we communicate to to uh, uh to clients about about what we're doing and what they what they can get out of it and what they can so, expect what, so where would someone look so so let, let's imagine someone that's not necessarily a, a geospatial or, or gis or survey back and they're now managing information where you know where do they start are there any resources from rics or do, do you know what i mean because it's such a big specialist area where, mm. where would someone that's sort of manage it let's say managing generic data and now, now some of that is imagery because the where, where where do they go? Where do they look? What what are they searching for? You know, how how do they get their foot in the door? Kind of thing. Well, I think that's that's probably the key now. The uh, uh, Steve compared to what we were dealing with twenty years ago is that now there's loads of information available. Then there wasn't so much information available. Like international satellite imagery, you would have been able to get some from Landsat probably twenty years ago. But generally, there's now so much uh e e either uh, a kind of national agency like uh e like the copernicus information or from individual kind of uh you know private paid for 
services, you know, even even military or ex-military, that the, there's a there's an absolute, you know, uh, I suppose tsunami of information out there and data and understanding how it works together and where to get it from, what to use, is is something that a professional, a professional geospatial. Uh, uh, a geospatial professional should be able to advise clients on. Say, for instance, you're a landowner. You need a certain type of information it, that that may be provided by, you know, uh, you know, by DEFRA, you know, due to farm subsidy payments or, or the, of course, the uh, the environmental land management schemes that are now coming out. You you may go to other kind of commercial services or direct to your ordnance survey, depending on what you want to do for for your needs. If if you're a large infrastructure provider like HS2 you'll need to access geospatial information for a variety of different sources. And I think that that data management and maybe having a bit of a plan in place that you discuss with a professional, you know, either GIS or geospatial professional before a job starts during the procurement process can, can really help uh, clients understand that. One of our best outputs last year was our sixth edition imagery guidance. That's, a, that's an RICS standard you know, that all of our members have to adhere to. And it's particularly strong on, on helping clients with procurement. So we expect, you know, so a lot of local authorities and national agencies, they will quote that, you know, we, we want this imagery delivered to ordinance or, or, or ICS uh, uh, specification. So uh, in that uh, imagery guidance, we, we decided to, to not only look at our traditional area of aerial photography, helicopter and, and fixed wing, but also drone output and satellite earth observation as well. It's the first time that the three different platforms and the myriad different sensors involved have actually been combined into one area. So we can start to look at those accuracies, start to look at what clients need, and they can start to look at what kind of data processes they need in place to be able to manage the information to uh, to give them the best service and to and to get out of that data what they what they so, want. Thanks, James. So there's two key points there. First, for people who are sort of generic information managers or data managers, there are professionals, A, yeah. which, again, that's self-evident to us, but remember, this is a general. So there are professionals in these things, RACS being one organization. There's others. And then that guide, is that a free guide? Maybe I'll link yeah, to that. That's, that, that that's, link link yeah. that in. De yeah. Definitely. I think yeah. that's worth, uh, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, it's accessible. And I think it's got, but it, it, it delves down into some some key issues for us in the, in geospatial space. So understanding control, first off, how that works, how you nail imagery to the ground in a geospatial context, of course. You know, that interoperability between different platforms and multi-sensor operations, which are becoming totally normalized now, you know, from five years ago, gaffer taping a, a, a scanner onto a drone and flying it around an aircraft hangar, scaring people. Now to all of these been like cameras, uh, kind of inertial navigation systems, GNSS, all going on to one, one kind of drone system, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it's usable for certain things. It's not the panacea for all ills. And there are other types of uh, methodologies that can be used. And that's what the professional's job is. Advise the client appropriately to deliver the, the expected output that, that they want and that they paid for. And I think that that's a key thing as a way, you know, how costings work about uh, about understanding client delivery. Yeah, about what they paid for. Of course, I, I went, can't resist saying, uh, talking about BIM, but the but the international standards ISO 19650 series that that's where they tie in as well don't they or mm -hmm. they could they could do where there's a framework around that's right yeah that they help um, so, so we reference we reference those ISO standards which which you know some of them are quite impenetrable so uh, us and other bodies we take we take ISO and CEN and BSI standards and we will basically operationalize them that's what ours do they're 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 for their field orientated procedure orientated so they're operationalizing either government policy or we're operationalizing kind of iso standards you know into a field operatives hands if needed so you know our measured survey spec from a couple of years ago you know connects into what them were i suppose evolving bim standards yeah. you know about what people wanted particularly for uh, uh, measured building surveys you know, because uh, there's so many people who use measured building surveys, not just the high end kind of view, uh, engineering level, BIM level, but also people who are doing valuation, you mm. know, who may just yeah. need floor plans to a certain scale, people who are doing planning and development, who will need to understand the kind of the, the space that's being used from a, a financial viability point. QS is, of course, for measurement, 
cost estimation of a project, you know, and uh, environmental for the uh, uh, as, as we know now the uh, the energy certification and the things so that that three D kind of element is important in that, mm. but not not needed to be as accurate as we may we may think of when we're talking about a BIM model for say a refurbishment job. Yeah, and I I completely uh, uh, sort of echo that as well. There are so many different or potentially so many different stakeholders. It's like mm. people need to get the language right, the audience. I mean, RICS obviously they're focused on that. That's what they do they know they have a different audience set mm. and there's different but i think that's a challenge challenges a lot of other people that maybe aren't working for industry organizations like ricks where they don't see that they don't acknowledge the fact that there there are different layers of uses of information and that's that's risky i think isn't it well, it is, and I remember seeing a, p a presentation a few years ago well just as we were in the i suppose just the no, but a couple of years into that, uh, it, when laser scanners become became more affordable, more available, and of course lighter, so you, you didn't need to have arms, uh, you know, like a bodybuilder to be able to lift them onto a tripod. They were not like 10, 15 kilos and stuff. And uh, uh, and so there's somebody had done, I saw a presentation, done an incredibly accurate kind of point cloud, wireframe model, the whole kind of thing. And uh, uh, and the it, of the Treasury Building just across the road from where we are in Parliament Square, and then I'm speaking to them about you know we produced all this, we gave it to Treasury. They said great, but we only wanted it so we could measure, so we could so we could uh, what you procure a a window cleaning company to do all the windows in the building. <laughs> So they wanted it for a specific purpose. There was no need to go to the nth degree. And sometimes uh, that, that, that again is back to that initial conversation with a client and really understanding what, what do you want to do with this data? There's no point scanning the entire M25 if they basically just want to see how many gullies they have and cat size so they can do the procurement for the cleaning contracts. So it's horses for courses in this and i think we could and within geospatial we can provide any accuracy for basically any 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 want and need that a client would have but i think nailing that down to the start with the appropriate kind of costs attached to it and deliverables is a, is a key part of what a professional services should be yeah and i i think that's that's so true like the purpose of it where <laughs> In in a lot of my day job, people say, "Oh, we could we could laser scan everything," and I say, "We well, you, you could do, <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. but exactly to what end? You've just got you know it it, it it might be that people just want an asset register, or you know it might be they want an an index of whole buildings. Yeah, no, they, they they may need the yeah. after after that discussion you made kind of you know uh uh. uh warm out that they that they need actually something more than they think that they do. You know, but uh, I think those initial conversations are are, are incredibly important, and and surveyors need to be prepared for that. And there's still this is just an observation. I don't know if you've got anything to add because you've mentioned imagery. <clears throat> I guess for us, there's a spectrum. I mean, there is a spectrum, obviously, from laser scanning all the way up to imagery mm -hmm. and everything in between. And but I think that's still a challenge, isn't it? I don't know if you've got anything to add that traditionally they are sort of separated fraternities, like mm -hmm. remote sensing people. A different do you still see that disconnect sometimes or less yeah, yeah less and less and less i think it's okay. becoming to it's the interoperability between the sensors and it's essentially you know the geospatial data capture either it's a, 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 if, if done by a gnss receiver on the ground uh, in an rtk sort of detail survey or using a reflectless total station or a drone or aerial imagery it eventually ends up you know uh, as, as geospatial data and I think that's that's the tread, and accuracy, of course, and understanding control is a tread that joins all of this together, you know. And I remember when uh, when laser scanners were first being being used, we, you know, the principles. It was a new technology, but the principles applied to its control from a geospatial point of view were the principles of classical terrestrial photogrammetry that's been around for you know since the invention of of cameras, yeah. and the same aerial imagery as well, you know, lidar etc lots of the principles behind all of this are still quite quite fundamental and i think that's the great thing about this profession and i when i mentioned at the start about tracing our lineage for ta back thousands of years it's the same on many of the those key principles of classical survey directly applied to geospatial capture you know redundancy of information understanding control working from the whole to the part 
and uh, and I don't think that's ever going to leave us because it's a it's a it's a very strong set of principles around good data management. And I, and I completely agree with you. I was, I was just I can't remember the 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 years, but I remember reading you know when airplanes were invented. I think within a year or something like that, they were they were already doing reconnaissance. Uh, photos, you know. After mm. I, 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 I'll have to put. I'll put a quote in or a link down from, from what it what actually is. But literally within months, I think, rather than years, you know, we've got a flying machine. Let's put cameras on it. There's a there's yeah. a use for it. I mean, and I, I see that with with new technologies. I know you've mentioned GPS, GNSS. Again, for people that aren't from this background, and obviously, mm. you know, that's the sat nav, right? Again, the, unbelievably, James, there might be people that don't make. The initial link between you, you name drop selective availability again. Mm. The, these things will escape people. You know they, they don't necessarily make a link between these things because it's because it's not their domain. And I think it, that's the point. Uh, hopefully, of this podcast uh, as well is to say there are different domains out there. There are specialisms. And your point was there's a lineage. And I th I think the danger is sometimes that people don't appreciate that lineage. So, for example, web web mapping. There's nothing wrong with web mapping, mm. but there'll be people that have moved into making web maps that don't understand any any of the things that you're you're talking about because they don't have that lineage. So that's yeah, you that's, see that that's as a right. risk. Yeah, or... no, I think that that that's okay. I think it's a, it's a broad family, and I'm speaking to many many professionals in their in their sectors, like many of them you know as well, who who often talk about that. Not the, the the fact that geospatial skills are kind of spreading out. So rather than being a, a kind of a cohort of of like highly trained experts, there's actually a lot of people who there is a, a cohort of highly trained experts, of course, to go to specific uh, degree and postgraduate courses, you know. But there are also people, say, within the in the world of geography who are doing uh, uh, like geography graduates for instance who are using geospatial on a very of uh, geospatial data on a on a on a you know on a ubiquitous level and you're right you know to trace that lineage like you know the navigation all those services were enabled by that by that one moment in, in 2000 when clinton signed off on selective availability for gps primarily de developed for the military like like most things that we use within geospatial but you know but then with huge downstream commercial effects enabling everything yeah. from you know emergency services to uh to to what you call a uh, 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 aircraft navigation to uh, uh, pe people's mobile phone usage to all this kind of uh, uh, type of information that's all flowed uh, out of all this and i think that we 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 in geospatial we don't we don't own these things. Mm. We're we're fantastic kind of technical magpies, where we uh, where we take things that are useful. You know, drones the same. We didn't invent drones. The military again, of course, laser scanners. We didn't invent them, but you know, uh, we're good at using them when we can see an application for them. And it's about getting that once again. You know, making yeah. sure that you're using the appropriate instrumentation for the uh, geospatial data capture or you or uh, uh, task at hand. Yeah, I, and I completely agree with you. J just because um, I, I don't, I don't have you for too long, so I'll just change the topic if I can. And or it might, it might be linked to what we were just talking about. Actually, what I mean for for people maybe moving into geospatial and, and data, what what sort of maybe one or two of the sort of the major challenges? It might be that you've already mentioned it. So, for example, interoperability, but it might be something mm -hmm. else. What what do you see as say the top, let's say two challenges? or that we still need to overcome you know where 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 could we put more effort to overcome some of I, these challenges i think i think the term that we mentioned a lot as we've been chatting steve and as we we know ourselves is around all around client education you know they don't know what they don't know so they they've got to we, we've got to make sure as profession that clients understand what the what what a good geospatial service means and what it can deliver because you know there's a lot of people out there offering all kinds of service, not a protected professional term, you know, so anybody can set up and do these kind of things. We don't need a race to the bottom, you know, people providing costs. But then again, the instrumentation, particularly from a data capture point of view, is quite expensive. So people are not prepared to go into it. Look at the way drones, that's a good example, actually, is the way that the drone services industry has developed. You know, so there's a lot, rather than everybody buying a drone, and training up somebody on the staff to fly it around the place. We have specific drone pilot companies, you know, who they've trained every 
everybody up. They're they're in they're they've got all their civil aviation authority kind of licenses engaged. And they go out and do the job, of course, under instruction from a geospatial profession to deliver what what the clients actually expected. And I think we we shouldn't fear that as as a profession that others are 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 capable of doing that because there's certain kind of uh, regulatory limitations that we need to take into consideration on that rather than thinking that we, we we have the sole right to do all of this. And I think that that uh, that's a bit of a challenge for us in the industry to, to be able to be a bit more encompassing. I would suggest that people with other related skill sets, you know, geologists, for instance, or people in the oil and gas industry, people in renewable energy, you know, using a lot of our information. When I, when I do assessments for RSCS uh, uh, for charter status, you know, uh, I, I see people from the utilities, you know, from uh, large landowners, from the Crown Estate, etc., all using elements of geospatial, you know, particularly around GIS uh, uh, data usage, large corporates doing the same kind of thing. And I think that's that's something we need to need to loosen up on. But I think those those challenges are still there of, of explaining to uh, to clients, to educating clients, and that's what part of our standards are meant to do, about what, what they can expect you know, mm -hmm. uh, and what they can't expect. And I think, uh, and another part of that, of course, is understanding the public and uh, uh, and what they can expect. And, you know, we, we produce a lot of consumer guides. We've just done one on flooding, for instance, two just on flooding, as we saw in the country. Uh, but, you know, back, back to that, like uh, we mentioned earlier about using good information for resilience purposes, you know, not people have to be able to protect themselves in many ways in flood areas now mm. and we want to provide that that uh, uh that type of advice that members of the public or citizens advice bureaus can provide people with and some of that flows over into geospatial data as well yeah i, I think that's it as well it's um educate educating people but also geospatial whatever term is used survey or mm. it's just used in plain sight this it reminds me of also things like the um building safety bill and we've we've got you know we're talking about the golden thread now have you got anything to add on that just about survey and how we about whether it's building safety or just the management of building information and building data i know there's uh you know there's room for improvement let's put it that way nationally but is is there anything that anything that we can point people to on Rick's website or anything you've been involved with around building information? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we we like we, like you know the the geospatial fraternity within our ICS is 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 reasonably small compared to the overall size of our ICS. One hundred twenty thousand members. We're about three thousand in geo, but you know where our, our, our colleagues say in building today. You know, they're a large area of practice over the quantity stores and commercial property. So their 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 need for specific building information is, is quite key to a lot of what they do. So building surveyors, they've there's a lot of work and a lot of BIM uh, uh, guidance and standards available from RICS about what they need. Uh, also building building information, IBOS, the International Building uh, Office Standard, which is looking at the basics of information that's available to it to enable a a a, 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 I suppose a more efficient running of office space, but also really kind of looking at issues of well-being as well and how people operate within. Uh, you, you you probably remember the term from about 10, 15 years ago, sick building syndrome, uh, particularly in central London, oh, yeah. where many people were crammed into offices that were unsuitable. And, uh, uh, and of course, clients uh, uh, and office managers and management companies don't want that to happen anymore. And look at the, look at the effects of information when a lack of it is revealed, you know, our fire safety work that RIS has done a lot of work on since the tragedy of Grenfell and even beforehand, you know, a lot of that is dependent on good building information at a scale that is that is available. You go into a hotel room, Steve, you look at that door, at that fire escape plan, <laughs> right, what's that? You know, this is basic information that yeah. people people should have available and they expect have available so I, I i see us working together with a lot of uh with a lot of a lot of building companies a lot of building owners are very concerned about data about their buildings understanding security issues of course uh, about making stuff available online but are very very keen on upgrading their their, uh, their actual building information 
Yeah, I, I think again that's where there's links with whether it's BIM or, or whatever whatever people mm -hmm. what language they use. Just to ask you straight up, which wasn't on the list necessarily things we're going to talk about, but ask you straight up, digital twins, <laughs> is that a term that either you use professionally, not necessarily what do you think about it, but is it a terminology that's being used a lot now, either with clients yeah, or yeah? I, I think so. I, I, I think I think actually it's 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 a bit easier to get your teeth into than smart cities. In a way, and uh, and also it it brings the building and the city bit together. One of the, mm. the problems we had over the last few years is, is people kind of thinking of smart cities that are operated by a by an authority, a government authority, or a city authority, and then loads of stupid buildings that give no information whatsoever because they're all privately funded and privately owned. So there's no necessity within getting a planning application to provide information of any source whatsoever. So, you know, it's a bit of a dead duck smart city without buildings going into them. So, but I think that the digital twin end of things, you know, is is more scalable. So, you know, our ICS Air building, we could we we have a BIM model of it. It's slight upgrade would make it in in the generic meaning a digital twin of, of our building, and you know, and then it's. You know, then the building next door, and and then the that area of London, and then the city at at a, at a wider level. So I think there's a, we do love these uh, terms, in, in the G, the world of geo. But uh, I, I when I know that it's working is when I see my building severe and quantity severe colleagues in my office using the term digital twins, and they are, and they weren't particularly using smart cities that much or previous terms. So I think it's a it's it's almost a a yes. melding together of the whole BIM building model smart city concept into something a bit more. I no, I, I agree. Wow. It's definitely a convergence and big and big swathes of GIS and survey monitoring sensors because it's that feedback loop. Is I know we know. I'm just saying for people listening, it's having that feedback loop where. People will often ask me, oh, what do you think about digital twins? Well, I'll say, well, one one of the main things is we never we never could clearly articulate this feedback loop. Like it was always a linear progression. You survey things, I'll make maps of it, and we'll all be we'll all be friends. But there was an end point. There wasn't this natural let's maintain it. So so that alone is a huge like step forward because that, you know, the digital digital twin requires that. If not as not a digital twin. Um, just, I mean, there's so many things we could could talk about, but um, it, just but because I've got a personal interest in it as well. It, I mean, what what are your thoughts on sort of things like blockchain? Again, this is sort of way sort of technical, and we without getting too much into the weeds. But a lot of people ask me about it, and I think, well, I know because I've 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 been in lectures where you've been there, where people have talked about it. It is being used in other countries for land ownership for cadastre, mm. but. Is, is there anything you could just share about things like blockchain and yeah, land ownership? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we've done a bit of work on, on blockchain, and uh, it is a great, R, good RICS uh, insight report actually on blockchain from a couple of years ago, which you can link into, which is freely available. And, and we look at blockchain in the context of not just land registration usage, but also in construction uh, uh, supply chain issues, agricultural supply chain, so the food uh, and the things as well. And it's extraordinarily good. For many many things and not so good for lots of other things you know uh within a cadastral context the problem is of course with blockchain is if bad information is put in at the very start it stays as bad information so a number of countries have looked towards moving to a fully uh, uh integrated land registration blockchain system but starting from a low bar where a lot of that that property and land would have been unregistered or unidentified uh, 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 beforehand, so countries like El Salvador, I think, and, and a couple of countries in South Amer in, the, in Central America have moved towards that. I know the Air Land Registry in in England and Wales has looked at it, as have the uh, other national agencies, such as the, uh, uh, the the land agencies in in Scandinavia, and they can see some uses. You know, particularly when we when we look towards uh, the, the the holy grail of e-conveyancing and complete online type of uh, exchange of property which that which i believe we had a great norwegian delegation a couple of weeks ago who were waxing lyrical about their fantastic system have they leapfrogged us although i know it's still difficult in rural areas in norway but in oslo exchanging property is, would be like buying or selling a car 
And that's what our land registry aspire to. But of course, we have a thousand years of history and all the bells and whistles that go with that and are over, over, overlinking types of issues. But, you know, the technology uh, and the things I think is very, very exciting for us in geospatial at the moment. Like, I'm, I, I think augmented reality is something that that's coming down at us we can see people or many of our colleagues you and me know Stephen, in uh, in heavy civil engineering using augmented reality on, on on an almost daily basis it's no big deal anymore the uh either true instruments true headsets i think machine learning uh and it, the, it's it's twin of, of ai is is really starting to get somewhere particularly in post-processing software uh, I've seen some amazing stuff done uh, uh, using laser scanning and point cloud manipulation, for instance. The cleaning of that data, which was very, very heavy duty beforehand, is getting better and better. And uh, and I think those type of uh, the, the, those type of interoperable issues are are really starting to get somewhere. There's some amazing scanning online now, which is so realistic, right. being driven, I think, by yeah. the cinema. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or the movie world, which is which is coming towards us, I think, and that that will again feed in the digital twins, and all all those types of issues that you know commercial property, the kind of surveys yeah, and, and yeah, people yeah. looking around the place and all that kind of thing. I think this Sorry, go on, go on, it, it, it's a big deal. I I was just thinking, gaming uh, is of course the other one which we allude to. They're talking about cinema. I I know that's um. Still not not quite as closely linked. Well, at least in my opinion, as it could be to things like survey and GIS. But I, I mean, it's happening right slowly. It is, and I. But you know, some games, as we you know, the Minecraft end of things, the way that the uh, we, we had a Minecraft, I think, of 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 various cities or buildings or even parts of the country that kids could go and play with. That's a great entry point into understanding how geospatial information and gis information works yeah and a, and a great entry point for for you know kids who are interested in geography as well yeah but have that kind of spatial awareness gaming is great for spatial awareness uh, i think and uh there, there was one called the getaway a few years ago which was based on a on a, a an actual simulation of london the reality of Oz, rather than a made made up world I think the uh, the the power of these visualization engines is 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 pretty is pretty heavy, and we're now looking at the metaverse, of course, you know, uh, and uh, what may happen there, and uh, and about how geospatial information may, may yeah, well, potentially well, feed it'd, into it'd all that. It'd be like. essential as a bedrock, I guess. Certainly, things like Tesla and all the rest of it. Of course, they're gathering data as they go. I mean, it. I, I think that's the challenge, isn't it? As as things progress it's things are in plain sight aren't they like you know there's a tesla mm. on the road it's scanning things right maybe they don't all have laser scanners now but w w they're still capturing objects that's going into a central database and you know unless i'm misunderstanding something i mean but people wouldn't think of it like that would they they'd just think you know they're, no. they're not linking no, 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 it they with the sensor I know, and I think if somebody wants to get an insight into what those big data uh big the big date get commercial data gathering exercise like like you mentioned tesla of course but say uber you know their their kepler uh, uh data visualization labs are, are really quite something quite sensational so every uber journey in england and wales over the last two weeks put into a, a, a visible data set now imagine how valuable that is from say a transportation and infrastructural development point of view you can see those pinch points immediately traffic points etc you know, uh, or where people have an accident or having to go somewhere else. It's live information. And I think it's almost like a, 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 a an indication of, a, of this kind of living kind of geospatial ecosystem of data where it's live. And I think with mapping, we're always, I think there's always a, there's always an idea that, oh, well, it's all being done or it's something that's quite static. And it isn't. I think geography and geospatial are, are, are kinetic all the time the built environment is changing every moment of, of of every day in central london it's always changing and keeping those things up to date back to the currency thing you mentioned at the start i think is a is a is a key is a key task for us and aspiration within geospatial yeah i know that the the example you gave there of uber having that valuable data set made me think i've got no conclusion on it but just to, so i hadn't really thought about that it becomes a obviously that's a commercial good yeah. 
un unless the law is uh, something that I'm not sure what it is in the UK. But you think there's a there is a public good in there, isn't there? So, for example, in London, Transport for London would like elements of that in, in the example you gave. I'd, you know, I, I, anyway, maybe in, in, in time, if not already, that might be have to be part of people's um, yeah, licensing you know. condition, you know? Like the 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 new ULES that's come in, you know, between the uh, extended, going to be extended as the M25, the ultra low emission zone, you know, the, the cameras going to be everywhere. They're going to be, you know, yeah. that that combined with other types of data sources, etc., is uh, is very very valuable information either from a well being, pollution, and particularly yeah. now as we as we move towards a a a, a sustainable net zero economy from a uh, from a from a carbon fuel based economy i think this this lie of geospatial kinetic information is going to become increasingly important yeah so ju just as we wrap up james i'll uh, again just ju just a, just a, a quick one whether it's talked about with either within rics i'm sure it is but with other people the, the united nations sustainable development goals which yeah. i normally drop are they how pervasive are they with people you talk to do, do people get it do people talk about them or yeah, I, I think it, I think it's almost generational, if I, if I can say that. I think younger people are very keyed into these things, very keyed into net zero, very in, in keyed into climate change. You know, uh, uh, I, I think when you look at the SDGs from a very high level, it can it, it can seem slightly impenetrable. No poverty. That that's a huge thing to say. You know, uh, uh, SDG number one. But you know, we in geospatial have an enormous role to play in that one, and several of them directly number 11 as well i think the one on uh, uh, uh on resilient urban infrastructure etc and even the social justice one i think it's about number 15 that the, these are incredibly important but it's when you drill down into them and go down into kind of like uh, you know into the different levels into the tertiary level almost where that's where you get to 10 year security is yeah. a primary part of, of understanding how you know that go of achieving that goal of no poverty so women's access to land vulnerable groups access to land in livelihoods etc like we were just speaking about earlier about our work with the world bank etc about understanding the you know livelihoods and economics and how those things work and how they're connected mm -hmm. to reduction of poverty where maybe it looks so unassailable as a as an enormous concept at the start looking at the sdgs i think once you, once you drill down into them if people take and a lot of people do do this uh that you can start to see how 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 achievable yeah, they it, are is that linking in incremental bits yeah sorry james you're finishing up no no i was going to say it's that incremental kind of elements of it isn't it and seeing what, what part you can play within it and, and what we can play as a profession and what professional institutions like rics and others can play yes it's having that context isn't it as if people are too focused I, I think like like you're saying i mean the tide is turned in the sense that people can't ignore these things now and it's the norm but mm. but uh, i've probably just about had my time with you so thank you but what you've mentioned several uh documents and references which i'll link to but is is there anything else so whether it's a website or a document are there another few things that you would recommend people go and look for and read and i'll link to them i i think the uh the, the geospatial.org.uk uh, website that's been done uh, from a careers point of view is a great entry point into people understanding the basics of, of geospatial information. I think some of the careers information that's becoming available, get kids into survey, is very good for younger people who are thinking about it as a potential careers, same as class of your own. Uh, uh, I think the RICS website and, uh, and several of our colleagues like uh, ICS and RGS, AGI of course, you know, there's a lot of information out there, and uh, I think and the profession is working to, you know, to to collaborate yeah. and bring that type of information together into 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 something more coherent. And uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot available out there. And what I would say is, any clients uh, kind of listening is to make sure when they're thinking about it, and they may even not even realize that they do need geospatial information. But if they have a if, if they do think about, it, they need to speak to a to a, a, a qualified professional. In the area so they make sure that they don't have any surprises because no one likes a surprise mm. and uh, and don't get overcharged and get the, and eventually get the product that they expected yeah 
yeah great thank you james i could talk all day you know me um me too but thank you yeah yeah it's a, i i've had my time with you so thank you very much for sharing your insights and your time james kavanagh from rics so thank you very much thanks for inviting me along Stephen. Thank pleasure you. cheers